welcome to epg patashala uh, my name is dugirala vasanta i am professor in the department of linguistics at usmania university today i'll be talking to you about uh, speech perception it is module number 6 in the psycho neuro linguistics course in this lecture i will talk to you about some concepts important concepts about how we how human auditory system perceives speech sounds and about the integration of vision and audition in speech perception let's start with uh, the hearing mechanism in the diagram that you see which i'm sure you are familiar from your school textbooks the auditory mechanism has three main parts the outer ear the middle ear and the inner ear and each uh, part plays a different role i will talk about the function of uh, the each part a little later but when sound enters through outer ear uh, and uh, is uh, you know the uh, three uh, small bones in the middle ear carry that sound and convey it to the inner ear the inner inner ear there is a lot of frequency and time uh, processing takes place in the cochlea the eighth auditory nerve takes the information from cochlea to the auditory cortex as you can see in the next picture on cochlea to auditory cortex pathway that is from cochlea the sound travels through many uh, subcortical structures through brain stem and mid brain and then reaches the auditory cortex which is in the temporal lobe of both hemispheres right and the left hemispheres as you know the different parts of the auditory mechanism has different functions the outer ear helps uh, in protection amplification of the sound and localization where the sound is coming from which direction the middle ear does a miss uh, impedance mismatch so uh, you know it's uh, it also conveys information to the uh, vowel uh, uh, window connecting to the inner ear also there is a lot of uh, pressure equalization as you know middle ear is connected to the throat through eustachian tube so when you have infections of the throat Uh, the eustachian tube does not function properly uh, and then you have uh, infection in the middle ear and that can affect your ability to hear speech so um, middle ear has uh, impedance uh, matching function and it has pressure equalization function and it also has a mechanical vibration uh, it conveys to the inner ear the in inner ear itself uh, look, uh, does a uh, whole lot of things happen uh, processes happen within the inner ear it uh, mechanical and hydroelectric electrochemical processes take place in the inner ear in transforming what we hear the environmental sounds uh, by the time they reach the brain a lot of transformations take place and in the central auditory nervous system uh, the information uh, it reaches the primary auditory area in the temporal lobe and then it gets passed on to the wernicke's area which is the interpretation center it's the wernicke's area which makes uh, which attaches meaning to the sensation that we hear so we are able to differentiate for instance uh, a, you know car horn from cycle bell or even environmental sounds attaching meaning to the sound uh, happens in the wernicke's area which is in the uh, temporal lobe the, the main auditory cortex is the temporal, temporal lobe so basically uh, our uh, human auditory system is very sensitive to wide range of sounds ranging from say about 100, uh, 100 to 10000 hertz but this we today we are talking about speech perception so let uh, to focus on speech sounds speech sounds range um, is not as broad uh, speech sounds uh, are spread out on the auditory spectrum from say about 200 to 8000 hertz Speech sounds also vary tremendously in terms of loudness. Uh, some are very soft, some are very uh, loud. Uh, vowels are louder than consonants, right? So speech sound basically speech perception involves converting acoustic signals which are going through our auditory mechanism to the brain, converting those auditory signals into representations in the brain. The representations are about phonemes or about uh, syllables about words uh, they are stored in the brain so uh, the speech perception is this transformation of uh, the information that we get from the environment uh, and making meaning out of those 
acoustic uh, signal. If you see the next uh, diagram, uh, this is an audiogram, uh, it is a measure of hearing sensitivity and if you impose speech sounds, how they are spread out in this auditory spectrum, the audiogram, the horizontal axis, you can see frequencies from 125 hertz to about 8000 hertz. Uh, most speech sounds are located between about 250 and 6000 hertz or so. As you can see in the lower frequency side, you have nasal, you have vowels and you have uh, voiced sounds. Uh, whereas the voiceless consonants are slightly on the higher side and you have uh, fricatives like sir, sh are very high frequency based sounds. And in terms of energy also, vowels and nasals are much louder than the uh, high frequency fricative sounds. Uh, so, the next chart also shows you clearly the categories, the phonetic categories which to some extent are present in many languages with some difference. So, you have vowels, you have diphthongs, liquids, glides, nasals. You examine this chart which you uh, may have learned from phonetics class. So, let us not spend more time on this. My focus in this lecture is to tell you how, we are, how our brain is able to distinguish these various sounds from one another and what uh, one's native language, how it influences this perception and how audition and vision come together in perceiving speech sounds. As you know from your fundamental course in uh, physics, uh, frequency is measured in hertz and intensity in decibels and each speech sound has another dimension, time, that is measured in milliseconds. So, we need to now understand for some of the consonants and vowels, what are the frequency, intensity and time dimensions are and that is the speech acoustics and much of my lecture is about speech acoustics. Let us look at some spectrograms. Uh, I have already pointed out that spectrogram is a plot of frequency versus time. So, observe how acoustic cues such as formants, antiformants, stop gap, voice bar, aperiodic noise, how they look like. Um, so, spectrogram displays the frequency information on the y axis and time information on the x axis. Acoustic energy is indicated using color coding. Since I am going to show you color spectrograms, you have to know that uh, the red or the orange is, uh, indicates loudest, that is, acoustic energy is maximum in the area which is marked by red, and purple is the weakest, the acoustic energy is weakest. Please remember this uh, when you are looking at the spectrograms. Periodic vibration of vocal cords generate formants. So, when the vocal cords vibrate, they uh, it is periodic and it, it comes out in the spectrogram as horizontal bars which are called formants. Um, nasal sounds uh, like na and ma also have formant like structure, but if you see in the spectrogram, uh, you see that there is not that much acoustic energy and they are weaker. Uh, you will not see red colored antiformants associated with nasal. Aperiodic noise is associated with fricatives. So, now see on the screen you have a spectrogram uh, showing uh, nasal antiformants. So, the word is mit. Uh, there is uh, antiformants uh, just before the vowel e in mit. Uh, you see there is not that much energy in the antiformants and then you have uh, the horizontal bars in red. So, that corresponds to vowel E which is very loud and therefore, you see red colored bars three of them and then you have stop gap. There is because the word is ending in voiceless plosive. So, there is no voice bar. It is called uh, you know stop gap. And then the t mit is uh, released, the plosive t is released. So, this is called release burst, the last part of it. So, um, this uh, bottom spectrogram is the word, uh, is the spectrogram, it corresponds to the word moss. So, the, uh, the acoustic cue which I said a periodic noise is very clearly visible here in the uh, the rightmost uh, side of the spectrogram uh, where you have, you do not see formants at all. It is aperiodic noise 
it corresponds to fricative sir fricatives produce fricatives in a fricate produce a periodic noise so you can see uh, a periodic noise and mos the vowel again is producing the formants here so in this spectrogram you have seen anti formants uh, and you have seen formants you have seen stop gap in relation to voiceless plosives you have seen a periodic noise which correspond to fricatives then you have a uh, next spectrogram corresponds to nab okay um so notice the anti formants corresponding to nasal consonant na again very weak formants corresponding to the vowel a voice bar corresponding to ba burst corresponding to release of ba right um uh, but uh, what about uh, not many of our words also have diphthong so what happens when we produce a diphthong the concentration of acoustic energy for vowels dip is reflected as horizontal bars which we are calling formants right but when the diphthong it's a changing quality of the vowel right so you see a movement in the uh, formant um, so the formants move when a word has a diphthong for instance a word like preempt preempt the you see the spectrogram next you see the formant is moving native speakers of english for instance any english word that starts with f t and k they pronounce it as t t k we don't do that but they do that that their phonological rule so when that extra puff of air has an acoustic cue you can we can show physically what happens when you aspirate a sound now uh, the cue the acoustic cue that you have to learn it's very important in acoustic phonetics it's called voice onset time the time difference between the release of the plosive and the time when the vocal cords vibrate is what is known as voice onset time this voice onset time is much longer for voice less consonants compared to voiced consonants so it can be measured in milliseconds and uh, the difference the voice onset time differences to distinguish voiceless plosives from voiced plosives differ from language to language they are not fixed they differ so voice onset time uh, in the next diagram that you see uh, it uh, the first uh, topmost one for instance uh, is the diagram which is saying uh, there is a closure phase every plosive there is a closure uh, phase uh, when the uh, lips are closed pa or ba and then uh, if the vibration starts during the blocked when the lips are still closed if the vo vocal cords vibrate then you generate what is known as voiced plosive which is bha or dh or gh these are the sounds which are like murmur which these these sounds are not there in english it makes no sense for them uh, for english people to uh, understand what is bha or what is dh but it is very important in hindi and telugu and many of our languages we make a distinction between bha bha dh dh uh, gh gh right so the first diagram says voicing starts even before the release of the uh, closure next uh, level you have voiceless unaspirated plosives we also say pa without aspiration pa palu palu we don't we don't aspirate right so voiceless unaspirated it's there in english also but in in certain position not word initial position uh, so in voiceless unaspirated uh, plosives at the time of release the voicing starts as you can see the the quiggle uh, you know is put along with the release the third uh, diagram is voiceless aspirated plosives that is the h t k which is very important for english as i pointed out here they don't say ki they'll say ki in english we don't we don't do it but in english speaking people say p t k there is an aspiration so that indicate that there is a lag even after the release there, there is no voicing hasn't started okay so the time difference between the release of the articulators and starting of the voice a voicing that is vibration of the vocal cords is what is known as voice onset time and the brain perceives this voice onset time and makes this differentiates different 
uh, sounds. So, in other words, to summarize what I have said about acoustic cues for different speech sounds, you have formants for vowels, you have antiformants for nasals, you have stop gap or voice bar for voiceless and voiced plosive, you have aperiodic noise for uh, fricatives and affricates. These, these are only examples of some of the acoustic cues corresponding to different phonemes. But uh, you must realize that each phoneme does not have one fixed acoustic cue. This is what is the, they, they are changing all the time. The acoustic cues are not fixed. Our ears and brain perceive these acoustic cues and contrast the meanings in words differently depending upon our native language. Now, this is a difficult point and we need to spend some time thinking about how native language influences speech perception. Uh, let's take an example from Hindi. Hindi makes a, um, I am not a Hindi speaker and I may not be pronouncing the words uh, correctly, but those of you who are Hindi speakers, you can try pronouncing them. Hindi, in Hindi, there is a word I believe called bal, which means hair, right? Bal is contrasted with dal. Dal is lentils, what we eat. Bal, dal. The dal is contacted with, with dal. Dal is branch, branch of a tree. Dal. And then it is contrasted with gal, which means cheek. Right? So, in order to, for the brain to uh, understand, perceive the differences in bal, dal, dal, gal, uh, it has to keep track of the various acoustic cues. But Say dal and dal, it makes no sense for English speakers. Because the and the are not two different phonemes in English. It's only relevant for Hindi. This is the language specificity of speech perception. Hindi contrasts hal, I believe it means knife blade, with bhal, which means forehead. So pha, pha, bha are contrastive in Hindi. They are not contrastive in English. English, there is no bha, right? So, each language has different phonemes. Each phoneme has underlying acoustic cues and our brain receives these cues, combines them in a, in differently to make meaning differences. Ultimately, communication is not about receiving sounds. Communication is about making meaning differences in words and that is where the language specificity comes. So, languages use acoustic cues differently to achieve contrastivity in meaning of words. Alright? So, uh, you also know that words have clusters in them. You know, kla, samyuktaksharam. In Telugu, we say that. I think it's there. Sanskrit also. Many languages allow pla, kla, bla, gla. So, uh, like English, German, Norwegian, Thai. But all these languages don't allow tla and la. Why? It's nothing to do with the ability to pronounce. We can all say tla. We can say la. But they don't allow. Right? English makes a contrast between ba and ga, pa and ka before la. So you have blue, you have glue, you have plan versus clan. You contrast. But the la and tla are not possible. As I said. Right? Take sra, S followed by R. It's totally banned in English. You, you open a dictionary and see you will not find a word which starts with sa followed by ra. It's not allowed. But Telugu allows, Hindi allows, right? So these these are phonotactic rules which sound can follow whichever sound is language specific. And that knowledge we have and that knowledge helps us to perceive clusters. Differently. Now, so in other words, language specific phonology, phonology when we move away from sound description to uh, combination of sounds and they function in language, we are moving from phonetics to phonology. So, different languages combine the speech sounds uh, differently. So, um, you have English, most words are consonant, vowel, consonant. Your cat, mad, bat, uh, whatever, right? Most words are C, V, C. If you take Telugu, it will be C, V, C, V. 
கதி நதி சளி காலி சிவி சிவி ஆர் மோர் காமன் ஸோ தேட் ஃபேக்ட் இஸ் அகெயின் லாங்குவேஜ் ஸ்பெசிஃபிக் சிலபல் ஸ்ட்ரக்சர்ஸ் இன் அதர் வேர்ட் சிலபல் ஸ்ட்ரக்சர்ஸ் வேரி அக்ராஸ் லாங்குவேஜஸ் அண்ட் வி ஹாவ் தட் நாலேஜ் தெர் ஆர் கோடாஸ் as i as i uh, told you uh, just a few minutes back that onset and coda are two parts of a syllable what is allowed in the onset position what is allowed in the coda position differ across languages then you have various other factors involving coarticulation and assimilation in fast speech all this influence speech perception maybe more about that later so we have talked about certain acoustic cues and how those cues participate in contrasting meaning difference so if you take uh, in the spectrogram that i'm sure uh, you will see in the on the screen uh, you will see burst what is burst burst is a cue for closes right it is followed by a transition uh, you know there is a um, form and transition is happening uh, but the way this burst and form and transition the way they organize themselves differ uh, uh, for different syllables uh, so you can go and look for a spectrogram uh, to see how pla is different from say um, cl or cl or whatever right in other words uh, a single phonological feature like voice i said p t k or voiceless b d g or voice right so voice is a very important universal phonetic feature but the phonetic value of that voice can change from language to language <coughs> right so <coughs> when you say voice onset time which i have already explained to you the range <coughs> so <coughs> the range can change across different if you take um, thai thai makes a difference between no aspiration mild aspiration heavy aspiration so it's not matter of uh, pa ba or pa ha it is pa ha ba you know the the contrastivity so in other words when you measure the voice on set time for pa ha ba the it varies quite a bit so brain has to keep track of this native language specific acoustic cues so uh, and they are changing all the time and you can think of the complexity when one is multilingual when a person is using english and telugu and hindi and uh, you know various languages together uh, and, and we are sometimes mix languages in india we mix languages when we are talking to a person when we know the other person knows the two two or three languages we mix and brain has to keep track of all that and still perceive <laughs> so basically i'm i'm uh, uh, emphasizing on the notion called invariance that is um <clears throat> there is no consistently reliable acoustic cue uh, or even a set of cues for any one phony they keep changing they change depending upon the phonetic context whether the the vowel is preceded by which consonant or followed by which consonant or what is the onset what is the coda mm, con- allowed mm, consonant speaker's voice you know that um men speak at a much lower pitch than women uh, that is called fundamental frequency fundamental frequency of men is about 100 hertz lower than that of women fundamental frequency of small children is double the fundamental frequency of women so we are talking about 400 hertz for children 200 hertz for uh, women 100 hertz for men that is the Uh, fundamental frequency because which is influenced by the thickness of the vocal cords the d- distance between uh, glottis that is space between the vocal cords to the lips that uh, entire distance those physiological variables influence uh, fundamental frequency you also know that uh, at puberty uh, first uh, you know if you are listening to 3 or 4 year old children inside a room you cannot make out how many boys how many girls they all speak at 400 or you know 380 or 450 or whatever but at the age of 11 12 the boys fundamental frequency falls from 400 to 100 whereas the girls fundamental frequency doesn't fall that much from 400 to 200 so 
you also know that at puberty boys experience a lot of pitch breaks high pitch low pitch high pitch low pitch and then it stabilizes right all that is fundamental frequency so uh, men and women uh, spectrograms look different the acoustic cues uh, look different slightly based on speaker's voice speaking rate the some people speak very fast some people speak very slow that also influences the acoustic cues age and gender uh, as i already explained so these are these are all the uh, some of the reasons for invariance in the speech signal which is reaching the brain but brain is able to ignore all that and still perceive the meaning uh, role of context so suppose uh, if i say uh, let me read one sentence it was found that the eel was on the axle so where i made the click uh, one phoneme is missing uh, but if i give you a cue that this it is wheel then uh, i mean like in the sentence axle uh, tells you that the click um, corresponds to wheel but uh, the the same click correspond if the sentence had shoe then you would hear it as heel if the sentence has peel uh, i mean if the sentence has orange you would hear it as peel right the context of the sentence even if somebody coughed or even if the car passed by and you missed one acoustic cue this context gives you uh, information and you say oh that must be heel that must be wheel that must be peel right so contextual uh, context influences your perception uh the so let's now talk about what are the important questions research and speech perception is addressing so it the researchers are saying are there language specific differences in categorizing sounds so do everybody categorizes pa from ba in a similar way ta from ga in a similar way how do we uh, find out what are these categorization abilities of people speaking different languages how do children learn to categorize native and non native speech sounds this is very relevant in our context because we grow up learning two or three languages simultaneously in the playground we we have to speak hindi at home we speak telugu at work we speak english how do we learn how do how do we learn to categorize speech sounds and keep the categories separate what is the nature of reorganization of language specific phoneme perception as a child grows in other words if i do speech perception experiments on 4 year olds and on 20 year olds do they perform similarly is there a developmental trend in speech perception there is lot of research going on there um what are some of the top down and bottom up processes in speech perception top down is how much of our knowledge about language do we bring in to understand what we heard bottom up is how att- how much attention we are paying to the acoustic cue bottom up acoustic cues to knowledge knowledge to acoustic cues is top down how are these processes and how do they uh, meet these are some of the issues addressed by researchers so for that categorical perception is one of the earliest experiments done uh, to find out do people categorize speech sounds similarly across different languages so definitely we all differentiate per from ba uh, ka from ga ta from da everybody uh, whether you are english speaker or hindi speaker or telugu speaker you can differentiate but are there differences how what uh, what how much of acoustic information do you need to identify something as pa and is that Uh, acoustic information uh, does it change from native speaker to native speaker so these are the questions that experiments on categor- categorical perception research is address that so for instance uh, for english speakers the phoneme boundary between ta and da is about 35 milliseconds so any uh, you, see you have to realize that uh, now speech perception research has advanced to an extent that we can make synthetic speech we don't have to we you and i cannot control uh, the voice on set time therefore you use synthetic stimuli to do this experiment and categorical perception so if you uh, give to the ear a synthetic syllable with uh, which is of about less than 30 milliseconds all english speakers 
call it the and if it is more than 40 they'll call it the i told you voiceless has higher voice onset time voiced plosives uh, have lower voice onset time but english speakers require 30 or below milliseconds uh, to perceive it as a voice 40 or more milliseconds to perceive as voice right but this 30 40 thing it not it doesn't remain for spanish from german and from telugu uh, native speakers require different amount of acoustic cues to make the same categorization same categorization between two sounds you require different degrees of acoustic phonetic information so in addition to that uh, if what you are hearing is a word and not a non word that influences your perception it's called lexicality effect because our brain is able to grasp the meaning and therefore you can uh, you know fill in the gaps so words are perceived better than non words so uh, in the diagram that we are showing you on the screen uh, there are two uh, one red line and a blue line they they represent uh, uh, you know the voice on certain experiments where uh, so for instance up to a point the uh, the red line uh, up to a point you hear um, one sound and after that your discrimination ability falls down right so it, this is a weak form of categorical perception exists for all consonants but vowels are classified uh, not categorically but it is a little more continuous when you talk about speech perception, there is continuous speech perception, mostly it applies to vowels, categorical speech perception which applies to consonants and categorical speech perception is not universal. The acoustic information required to categorize sounds is uh, varies from language to language. Now, not only that, as I said that the phonological principles of a language influences your perception. How, how do you explain this? Let's take for instance, uh, for both Korean and English speakers, uh, the verbal transitions, remember the formants, the formants uh, either go up like this or come down like this, those are the transitions. The verbal transition information is very important for both Koreans and English speakers. They signal differences in place of articulation, whether you are hearing the which is forward or ka which is back. Right, place of articulation information is signaled by form and transition, and they're important for Koreans and English. But speech perception research has shown that Korean listeners are better able to identify consonant place information from transition stimuli alone than American listeners. All right. In other words, that that acoustic cue called form and transition is more salient in Korean than in English. This has to do with the functional load of phonological contrast among tens, blacks and aspirated stops in Korean compared to English. In other words, you have phonological categories, phonetic categories, they all have uh, acoustic cues, but the acoustic cues contribution to contrastivity varies from language to language. So, the conclusion is speech perception is language specific, alright. Speech, but I said phonology influences speech perception. Now, the other way is also possible, speech perception influences phonology. So, uh, for instance, there are some contrasts which are very weak to hear, some are very uh, strong. So, for instance, uh, in English pluralization if you take, when you say dishes or judges, you have a as, right? That because the it's very difficult to, I mean, uh, naturally we come up with certain repair strategies by inserting a vowel, appendices it's called, uh, so that the contrast becomes salient and perceptible. Uh, so, dishes is much more uh, easy to hear that dish. How do, how do I put S after S? You can't, you can't do that. So, we insert a word. So, the, in other words, the speech perception uh, makes certain demands uh, so that uh, you come up with repair strategies. 
Stop never undergo place assimilation in any language unless nasals do. Nasals are weaker, they, they are low frequency based, uh, so there is a implicational relationship among different consonant groups. Alright, so because nasals have weaker acoustic cues, they are very weak, therefore uh, the in fast speech, uh, you know, we, we, we say, when we say did you, we don't say did you, we don't speak like that, we say did you. This is a Did you? Did you? Did you eat? Right? This is assimilation. Right? So, in other words, this assimilatory phenomena and repair strategies, all these are indication that perception also places certain demands and influences the phonology of different languages. Alright? So, in other words, you have to pay, you have to learn a little bit about what is the difference between assimilation and co-articulation. I have also said there is co-articulation. So, assimilation is a slightly higher level phenomena. It is a phonological phenomena. Co-articulation is more uh, mechanical, uh, bio-mechanical uh, lower level process. So, in order to understand this, in your module, uh, I have given a task for you. Uh, I worked out one example. I said, when you say in peace, in peace, we do not say like that, in peace. It is actually becoming ma. It is not in peace. It is in peace. So, that is called labial assimilation. I wanted you to work out four more words. In vain, one thing, that car, like you. So, read up the uh, material that is given to you. Um, tell me which of, which kind of assimilation is taking place in in vain, one thing, that car, and like you, when you say it fast. I will not give you the answers, but you try and work it out. So, now the question is, is auditory perception different from speech perception? So far, I have been telling you only about perceiving speech sounds. What about our ability to perceive all kinds of environmental sounds? So, in what way is auditory perception different from speech perception? So, many years ago, I think in the 70s, they did an experiment called duplex perception. What they did was, they took a syllable, CV syllable, they fractured that into two portions. One is form and transition, it is a clear cut acoustic cue in isolation, right. So, when you take only form and transition synthetic stimuli and give it to your ear, it sounds like ch, some ch, right. It has no meaning, ch, it has no meaning. But if you say pa or ta, you know, in some languages, ta means give. It, it can have some meaning. So, when you attach the steady state portion of the vowel along with the form and transition, then it is more meaningful. So, what they wanted to know is, what mechanism is playing a role in hearing and perceiving ch as opposed to cha, right? So, you look at the spectrogram we are showing you on the screen. The circle uh, shows transition of the third formant alone given to the left ear and then everything else is presented to the right ear. That is transition plus the formant which contains the vowel information. The entire information is given to the right ear and left ear is receiving only the formant transition which sounds like ch, ch or whatever. So, I believe listeners heard both. So, it, what does it mean? How, what, what sense to make about duplex perception? What the researchers are saying is, there is an auditory mode of perception for environmental sounds which brain receives from both the ears, integrates it and makes sense of it. But there is a phonetic mode which is language specific and that information is uh, processed better from the right ear. Why right ear? From right ear, it goes straight to the left hemisphere. In majority of the people, speech and language is understood and processed by the left hemisphere. So, the right hemisphere receiving all the information is processed like speech, made sense of like language. Uh, so, that mechanism is there. At the same time, we can also hear like that, you know, those sounds. So, this is what is called duplex perception. 
both categorical perception and duplex perception are uh, cited as evidence that speech is a special module in present only in human beings and at birth right so both these experiments are endorsing modularity all right now okay so so far what we said um, to recapitulate we are saying acoustic cues are important but there is no one acoustic cue underlying each phoneme uh, acoustic cues combine differently to make meaning differences contrastivity language specific contrastivity is produced by different combination of acoustic cues which the brain is able to perceive uh, there is uh, there is some amount of information coming from auditory perception but a special speech module must be present in the left hemisphere which is capable of processing language specific speech information from speech sounds that's a phonetic module speech is special is the argument so far but there is also phonotactic constraints which influence speech perception there is perceptual assimilation you may have heard that japanese uh, listeners and speakers they don't make a distinction between r and l to them when somebody is saying r and l they only they have only one percept right it's uh, uh, perceived as r uh, but when presented with a uh, so what happens when they hear drama when japanese people hear drama they report hearing the do ra ma they insert do they the da and ra cannot come together in japanese so uh, what did you hear drama do ra ma they will even pronounce it as do ra ma they hear it as do ra ma in other words the listener perceives illusory phonemes phonemes which don't exist are perceived because your language forces you to listen according to the principles of your language which are relevant to your language right so they are able to now talk about um, there is a phenomena called mcgurk effect it's uh, very interesting and uh, on the screen you will see a website uh, if you go on the website uh, they will actually give you a demonstration of how this mcgurk effect works basically it is named after harry mcgurk when you are made to listen auditorily ba at the same time you are forced to look at the lips which are saying ga you report hearing da all right so we um, in other words what happening magnitude of this effect is influenced by competence in lip reading of course and also listening conditions if there is lot of noise you will pay more attention to the lips so you first look at the website have a demonstration but what is the explanation for this mcgurk effect vision plays a role in the perception of differences in place of articulation audible speech determines you need audition for differentiating voiced from voiceless if i say pa ba you can't say anything on the lips you have to hear it audition plays a greater role in differentiating voicing the vision plays a greater role in differentiating place of articulation and when there is a clash uh, the brain uh, gets confused the two modalities get fused and support perception resulting in the uh, or gar whatever the brain tries to find the most likely stimulus given the conflicting cues when there is a conflict between vision and audition it just settles for the most likely one right in other words uh, maybe the audio visual integration is taking a uh, place pre lexical stage that is even before you reach the mental lexicon uh, this confusion is happening and brain somehow uh, so this brings me to the summary of my lecture today there are just four or five points i will uh, just repeat that there is considerable variability um, among acoustic cues that underlie perception of different speech sounds that is there is no one acoustic cue relating to one phoneme and the other way around also you can have one phoneme with many acoustic cues or you can have one acoustic cue for many phonemes so there is a lot of variability
categorical perception and du duplex perception support motor theory of speech perception by holding that there is a close relationship between speech production and speech perception all right perception of language specific phonemic categories is influenced by lexical knowledge knowledge about words or mental dictionary what we know about words influences the way we perceive phonemes also and it is language specific both auditory and visual modalities contribute to speech perception and the degree to which we understand the intended message and i only dealt in this lecture i only talked about how the focus was on speech sounds but in real life we don't hear individual sounds we have to move into words and the next uh, uh, talk uh, next module uh, deals with word recognition i hope uh, the main gist of what i have uh, tried conveying to you uh, you have understood uh, do consult the e text as well as uh, additional reading material we have mentioned in the e text which will uh, help you to uh, clarify some of the points thank you